numerous times and said numerous times, and that is that as a child, I was scared in church. I was scared because the pastor of the church, if you can call him that, was always talking about this is the end time and horrible things are going to happen and we're going to have beasts and all kinds of monsters and uh, flying red dragons and women having babies up in the air and stuff like that. And it just scared me to death. It, it did get me up to the altar just about every other Sunday and uh, up there at the altar crying and screaming for mercy. I wondered if I died that night, whether I'd be in hell. But one of the things that was stressed in the churches I went to was, for youth especially, Revelation movies. I thought it would be really exciting to miss the rapture because I saw on the movies that young people were running all over the place, trying to stay away from the cops and the religious police. And there were certain churches where nobody was left, and then certain churches, they were full. And most of the churches that were full, the minister was wearing a collar. Now, none of them went, and the minister couldn't explain it. I don't know. I don't know. I thought that would be really neat. And now, uh, if it happens tomorrow, I'm too old to run around like that, I think. So, so are some of you. So I made it a, one of my bucket list items at that time to try to find out what it all meant. As a matter of fact, in 1978, I had a reporter come to my house, and he, did, he was interviewing people around the neighborhood that were kind of well-known, and I was well-known because I was a musician there. And he came and do a little bio on me, which I still have, as a matter of fact when I was handsome. And uh, one of the things that he asked me was, what, is, what are some of the things you want to accomplish? Well, let's see, I was, uh, in 78, I must have been 25. Is that about right? One of the things I wanted to accomplish was to interpret the revelation rightly. Because see, that carryover from childhood still was with me, and soon after that, I decided to uh, fulfill my calling and go into the ministry so I would have the time and opportunity to learn these things. But I also wanted to set it to music once I figured it out. And so um, that was part of the quest. And that's what I did. And what I found out in the last, no, oh, I'd say last 20 years, especially as I was reading Josephus for the first time, Jewish war. I kept running into places in the wars that seemed awful much like things that were happening in the Revelation. Of course, by this time, I knew the Revelation pretty well. Things just seemed to fit as far as the, well, the fighting, the Roman army that looked so much like some of the uh, beasts that flew out of the pit, uh, there was numerous things I read in Josephus that, like the hunger, the famines that went across Israel in those days that were an awful lot like the one of the four horsemen, and the death, and the destruction. And so I began to put this together, and certainly I was not the first. This had already been done to a great extent. But I discovered it independently, too, in reading Josephus. And I still have my, I still have my text with uh, the certain places marked in there. And when I do these kind of seminars now, usually I only need to do three chapters. Because there is so much in three chapters that we could look at and make a realization. And I'm going to say it, that Revelation already came to pass that by three chapters, usually the people are convinced of it and they can go look on their own. I'm going to keep doing this one until there's no more interest in it. And if there continues to be interest, I'll, I'll go through the whole book and uh, show you what is called now the preterist interpretation of revelation. Preterist 
is a term that means that the people that espouse this position believe that at least part of Revelation has been fulfilled. But what I think is that either it all has to be fulfilled, all the conditions of it, all the symbolism of it, either it has to be or it's not. The only place where we can actually place all this symbolism and uh, prophetic history in a historical setting is in the first century in Israel. Now, other people want to say that, yes, this can also have a future fulfillment, but I would be loath to, to lead anybody in the direction to say that everything in there could within a seven-year time period. And that's what we're dealing with in Revelation over and over again, a seven-year time period. You can turn to just about any Latter-day prophet and ask them what the woman uh, with her head in the sun and the moon under her feet in chapter 12 is all about, and they'll give you some modern-day interpretation. But what do we do then with the beasts or the whore of Babylon in Revelation 17? What are we going to do with that? Well, this isn't just a number of vignettes like John lays out, I mean to say, these aren't just different acts one after the other, and they're discombobulated, and you can use them modulate, take them out and get something to fit in your own time uh, period. This is made to be a whole, and we know that because in the last chapter it says that anybody takes away or adds to this book will incur the same kinds of plagues that are in the book. So the intention here is that it is all a unit. And we can see that it is. I want to go back a little bit to the Old Testament and look at the prophecy, one particular prophecy that you've heard of before, no doubt. It's called the Day of the Lord or the Day of Yahweh. You already know that Lord covers up uh, 7,000 and some different testaments to the name of the Heavenly Father in the Old Testament. That's a lot. That's a lot that somebody doesn't want you to know about. But if we put it back into its vernacular, this would be the day of Yahweh. A day doesn't necessarily mean one day. There's a prophetic day that can be as much as a, a hundred years or a thousand years as is a day. We have two witnesses, too. And the first place I'll go is to a, a very familiar chapter, the end of the apocalypse of Zechariah, chapter 14, 1, where the end, this is an apocalyptic passage. I guess I need to explain the difference between prophecy and apocalypse in a minute here. Where Zechariah the prophet with the words of Yahweh, says, Behold, a day is coming for Yahweh, when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. The question is here, of course, who is you in Zechariah 14? Later on, it talks about the Feast of Tabernacles is going to be uh, honored all throughout the world, or it won't rain. Who is you? That the spoil is going to be taken from and divided in your midst. As we continue on, we find that the day of Yahweh is about the destruction of Jerusalem. In Malachi 4, we'll go a little farther. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord, or Yahweh, comes. That's Malachi 4, 5. Who did Yahshua say was Elijah? John the Baptist. He says, he is the Elijah that is spoken of by the prophet. That passage is also in Deuteronomy as well. So we have our master telling us that Elijah had come and that he was to come before the great and awesome day of Yahweh. I think I got some more here on that. Yeah, because I ended up down about a, 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 um, 
a foot down in my notes. What happens on that day? Yoel 231, which is cited in Acts 220. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and the terrible day of Yahweh come. We find that in great measure fulfilled in the New Testament. Here in Revelation 6.12, when he opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake and the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became as blood. Is that not a fulfillment of Joel 2.31? And didn't Peter in Acts chapter 2 proclaim this very same thing that was soon to come to pass? We get a really fuller version of what the day of Yahweh is in Isaiah 7. In that day, Yah will whistle for the fly that is at the end of the streams of Egypt, and for the bee that is in the land of Assyria, and they will all come and settle in steep ravines and in the clefts of the rock and all the thorn bushes and on the pastures. In that day, Yahweh will shave with a razor that is hired beyond the river with the king of Assyria, the head and the hair and the feet, and will sweep it away along with a beard. In that day, a man will keep alive a young cow and two sheep, and because of the abundance of milk they give, he will eat curds. For everyone who is left in the land will eat curds and honey. In that day, every place where there used to be a thousand vines, worth a thousand shekels of silver, will become briars and thorns. With bow and arrows, a man will come there. For all the land will be briars and thorns. And as for all the hills that used to be hoed with a hoe, you will not come there for fear of briars and thorns, but they will become a place where cattle are let loose and where sheep tread. This is very hard to figure out, this prophecy concerning the day of Yah. What he's talking about, if you take into consideration Isaiah uh, chapter 19, I'm thinking, when he talks about his land being Egypt, Israel, and Assyria, that a day of Yah would come when these places would be utterly destroyed, but he promises that they would rebound and become fruitful again, even to the point where once there were thorns and thistles, will be a place where sheep and cows could feast. Also in Isaiah 2.12, Yahweh Saviot, as a day. It says here in the Bible, the Lord of hosts. Hosts is Saviot, which means armies. And Lord is master. The master of armies has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Speaking again of his day. And speaking of him as the commander of armies. <laughs> We see in Revelation a fulfillment of that, in that we have the master of armies on the top of Mount Zion. Oh, I wish I could tell you the chapter, it's either 6 or 14. The master of army comes to the top of Zion and overlooks the destruction of Jerusalem on the day of Yahweh, which did indeed come on Tishbaav. 70 A.D. Isaiah 13. Well, for the day of the Lord is near as destruction from the Almighty will come. Over and over again, we are told throughout the Old Testament that it is Israel and Jerusalem especially that comes against Yahweh and his wrath falls upon them and that they would not recover until the day comes when Shiloh arrives. Behold, the day of the Lord comes cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land of desolation and destroy its sinners from it. This is also found in Isaiah 2, 9. I think that's right, yeah? The land. When we read in the scripture 
the word land. Unfortunately, our Bibles are so mistranslated in places, especially when it comes to that word heretz, that it's translated earth, but means land. Same within Revelation, the word in Greek, gay, which means land, is translated earth, as though all these calamities were coming upon the whole earth. If we retranslate every place where it says earth in Revelation, we get something quite different. And the land that the scripture talks about is a certain land. And that land is usually mentioned as the greater Israel, which is defined for us in Joshua chapter 1, from the Euphrates to the Nile River, and from the Mediterranean to Arabia. That's Eretz Israel, that is greater Israel, and Israel in particular is the old country called Israel with Samaria and Judea. Ezekiel 13.5, you have not gone up into the breaches or built a wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in battle in the day of Yah. Interpreted, it's talking about the wall around Jerusalem and the house of Israel and all the walls that were built around all the cities throughout Israel, Samaria, and Judea. All the major cities were walled in. In fact, we read again in the historian Josephus that it was his job sent out from the temple in Jerusalem to go and make sure that the cities were all bound inside walls in case of the battle that came from, well, they were things that looked like scorpions with claws in women's hair in case they might come build up the walls. No walls stood in the entire land in the seven-year war from 66 AD to 73 AD. Not one wall stood when the Romans decided to come. Ezekiel 30, for the day is near, the day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom, for the nations. Let's take a look at the word nations, ethnoi, in the Septuagint. I trust the Septuagint Old Testament by far more than the Hebrew Masoretic text, by the way. There's good reason for that. The Masoretic text has been done to pieces up until oh, about 900 AD. It had been changed and uh, altered by the Masoretes, which were a sect of the Pharisees or Rabbinicals, to the point when we find the Dead Sea Scrolls and saw what all was missing from it, it has become in many ways unreliable unless the Holy Spirit is the interpreter for you. And in this case, being a day of clouds, Revelation uses that word cloud, all clouds all the time. He's coming with clouds, as a matter of fact. He's talking about the Messiah, talking about the commander of armies. A side note that I've never seen anyplace else is that the word clouds in Greek, which is the language Revelation was written in, is Nephilim. You know what that means. It will be a day of clouds, fallen ones, a time of doom for the nations. I didn't finish my thought on nations. The word there is ethnoi. It means tribes. We get the word ethnic from it. Nations is another word. This is another place where we have throughout scripture, by the tradition of translators, they will use nations instead of tribes. They will use earth instead of land. And there are a few more like that that we'll run into. Joel chapter 1, alas for the day, for the day of Yah is near, and his destruction from the Almighty, it comes. 
blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Where? Where? Zion. Zion. Did you know that they got the name of Zion of the mountain of Jerusalem from Egypt? In the time of Akhenaten? Did the Mount Zion was there? Oh, that's off on another subject. Uh, don't want to get off track here. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain, for let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of Yah is coming. It is near. I don't know if it was meant to be thousands and thousands of years later. If it's near, John is going to say pretty much the same thing in the first two chapters of Revelation. The time is near. Behold, I come quickly. Joel 2, 11. Yah utters his voice before his army. For his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of Yah is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Who is able to stand, says the revelator. And again, I ask you to put your mind to the top of Mount Zion with the commander of army there and his hordes and myriads of saints who arrived to him in that grave time from the earth through martyrdom. That's what the rapture is all about, as we will find it in Revelation. Is there to be a rapture? I don't know about the future. All I can tell you is there was one. And it's recorded in history, and we read about it in the Revelation, that these saints, whom it says their souls were under the altar, that were crying out for vengeance because their land was completely destroyed in every which way. So we'll find out. They are brought back to life because they can't die. According to John chapter 5, those who believe in Yeshua HaMashiach and the one who sent them, sent him, supposing that means kept their commandments as well, they'll never die. Take a look, John chapter 5. And back to Joel. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of Yahweh comes. Indeed, Revelation quotes that. Is that being what happened? And also, we have it in secular history that it happened on that day, including the earthquake. For multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of Yah is near in the valley of decision. We'll soon learn about the decision. And I think probably the most effective use of a prophetic utterance from the Bible for today is in Amos 5. You know, there are numerous people that make their living from false prophecy. Even some of our most well-known Hebrew Roots teachers make their living from false prophecy. They think nothing of it to prophesy something even to the date, and when the date passes, it's on to another one. False after false after false. I don't know about you, but since childhood, I've been looking for these things to happen, and they never did. And now I know why. Yet we have teachers, not to mention Christian ones, that tell us that these things are coming upon us September 23rd, April 20th. When's next? What year? 2007, 1999. Time after time after time. But it doesn't happen, and they keep right on going, and people support them at a huge clip. By the way, when we get done here, we'll take an offering. No, we won't. Obadiah, nobody reads that book anymore. 
For the day of Yah is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your head. Of course, the word nations should be tribes. It's talking once again about the tribes of Israel that neglected or turned their backs on the commandments of Yahweh when they had been a chosen people. The Amos passage, I missed it, I'm sorry. Woe to you who desire the day of Yah. How many do today? I'm astounded to look at YouTube and see how many people who are in the religion business very much interested, almost gleefully, in speaking about the destruction on our nation from this when our nation is not mentioned anywhere in the scripture. If you translate it right, woe to you who desire the day of Yah. Why would you have the day of Yah? It's darkness and not light. How many of you heard teachers that take absolute salivating glee in laying out the horrible things that are going to happen to you and me in this country? Or how Yahweh is going to punish this country for all its sin? What sin? Of course there's going to be sin and lawlessness, unless you choose Torah. But I don't consider us anywhere near the most sinful nation on earth. If you think we are, then you don't really know what's going on in this world. And we know that the righteous will be saved from that punishment, even if it means martyrdom, because we never die. Zephaniah chapter 1, be silent before Yahweh Elohim, for the day of Yah is near. Yah has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. Once we learn the history of Israel in the first century, we can tell exactly what that means. What or who the sacrifice was and who the guests are that come in from somewhere else. Let's see, do I need to do the rest of these? I think I made my uh, point here, but we don't find this only in the Old Testament prophets. I'm going to cite Paul, Paul's predictions. And there are quite a few of them. And when Paul says, I would that you'd rather be like me, he's talking about not married. Why? Why? Can't I do the ministry and be married? No, you don't have time, because Paul knew exactly what was going on and what was going to happen within the next, well, Paul, we don't know when he died, within the next 10, 20 years of his life. There's no time for you to do that now. For he says, for you yourselves are fully aware that the day of Yah will come like a thief in the night. It'll come, and before you know it, it will be there. And when it did come in those seven years, nobody was ready. No one was ready. The thief came in and destroyed and killed and poisoned everything they knew or had and took away so many people, like that one passage in Matthew, some will be taken and some will be left. They explain that as the rapture. Woe to those who are taken, because into captivity you go. And that's where they went. Israel was completely wiped out of people by the time that was over, and the Romans got their revenge, and Yahweh changed the world. Thessalonians number two, verse chapter two. Be not quickly shaken in mind or alarm either by a spirit or spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of Yah has come. That has been used against what I teach many times. The point is, with Paul, it hadn't come. 
but was upon him and would come within 15 years of him making this prediction. Now we can look back and using the scripture as a guide, we can say, yea, but this did come. For the day of Yah will be coming like a thief, and then the skies will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the land and all the works that are done on it will be exposed. That's from 2 Peter 3.10, and that's a good translation from Young's. So we have another testimony to what was going to happen at any time and did. Revelation 6.17 says, For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? Who else does the prophets rant about? for wrath, the sake of wrath, but Judah and Israel. Okay, having done that to death, let's take a look at literary types. I should almost put this on the screen for you. Let's see if I can make it a little bigger. Okay, that ought to do it. There are two kinds of literature we find in the scripture that we call prophetic. But there's only one kind that actually is. I hope you can see this. It's a little list. There is apocalypse and there is prophecy. The main characteristic of real biblical prophecy is first and foremost, there are the words, thus saith Yahweh, thus saith the Lord. And then something is told by Yahweh through the prophet. It's about to happen then or in the sometime near future, we'll say within the next couple hundred years. That's prophecy. But so many other books of the scriptures are not prophetic. We don't have Yahweh speaking through the prophet at all. We have something quite different, and that is an apocalypse. Hold on a minute. I'm just checking the mute here. Oh, did I get it that time? Yeah. We call apocalypses prophecies. When apocalypse has a whole different um, purpose in our reading, in our scripture, in our faith. Apocalypse is a literary term, as you can see here. It didn't come into play until 1822. It refers to works written by Jews and Christians between 200 BC and AD 100 that share similar characteristics. And here are the characteristics of apocalypse. I'm gonna give you one up front, and that is that apocalypses do not tell the future. What they tell is the present. And they're written in prophetic language so as to let the other ones of the tribe know what's going on in a particular place without the enemy knowing. This is why they are kept in prophetic language. Nobody can figure out an apocalypse unless they know the symbolism of the Jewish and Hebrew prophecies. Only the ones that knew the Jewish and Hebrew prophecies were Jews and Hebrews. So when somebody writes an apocalypse, behind the symbolism is the fact that what's happening in history then, for the purpose of sending an encrypted message, in this case, to those whom Josephus calls barbarians, speaking of Hebrews and Jews outside of the economy of Israel, 
those that were concerned about Jerusalem, Israel, and the temple, but didn't live anywhere near. And you know, because of the dispersions of 700 BC and 500 BC, Israel, then Judah, these people were slung out everywhere. Egypt, Africa, east of the Euphrates, in Europe, as far as Britain, probably right here in this hemisphere as well. Some apocalypses besides Revelation are Daniel. Daniel tells about the period that he lived in, which was about 165 AD, using the name of Daniel as a well-known prophet of the past. Hold on. That is called plagiarism today, but it wasn't then. It was a high honor to speak in the name of a well-known prophet. In fact, the only place we read about Daniel the prophet is where? In Ezekiel? Or in the first couple chapters of Daniel, which is of an earlier time. An apocalypse uses pseudonyms. They're written as if by an ancient figure such as Enoch or Abraham. Zechariah is an apocalypse. It tells about what's going on there at that time to a great extent. It's certainly true of Revelation. Apocalypses are usually written from a context of oppression, persecution, despair. Is that true of Revelation? Absolutely. Look where the one who is revelating is. He's on Patmos for the sake of two witnesses, the word of Elohim and the testimony of Yahshua. Here you have a key to what the two witnesses throughout the revelation are. There's always a heavenly intermediary, an angel, or one who appears to be an angel, to interpret the revelations and visions given. You can think about revelation of Yahshua HaMashiach to, to John, and you remember there was an angel guide in there. It's never told exactly who, might be Messiah himself. But when John is asked to reveal what the vision he saw is all about, he says, I don't know. You can say, and it's always the angel that speaks to what it is. Same way with Daniel, same way with Zechariah, same way with Enoch, same way with Third Baruch, the heavenly intermediary. Apocalypses contain sharp dualism, right from wrong, evil from good, the good team, the bad team, a contrast between the present age, dominated by evil, and a coming age, not only of change, but of paradise. We find that in Daniel, when Daniel gets so far in his vision to talk about what's happening there during the time of the Maccabees, so we can let other Hebrews know that are not in the area, he comes to a place where he can no longer prophesy. He comes to the present. And when an apocalypticist comes to the present, there's always and interference by heavenly forces to come and punish the evil ones, justify the good, and bring forth a new heaven and earth. Actually, in Daniel, that happens two times. One time it happens, the writer puts it in, and then something else happens in the history that they're speaking of, and he has a second time when there's an angel that comes to reveal the kingdom. Apocalypses are always filled with prophetic symbolism. I don't know if you're familiar with 4th Ezra or not. It's also called 2nd Esdras. It too is an apocalypse about those same years, 66 to 73, the Roman-Jewish War, first one but it's much harder to interpret. Sometime 
pick up, if you have a complete Bible, you'll have this with the apocryphal section in it. We've been told, most of us, that 300 or 400 years, God was silent in between the Testaments. Not so at all. That was some of the pro most prolific writing that there was in history because Israel and thereabouts had been so inundated by the Greeks at that time that they had learned a lot about how to interpret their own writings through a Greek mindset, which I hear over and over people say that's bad. But let's put it this way, through an informed mindset. In Apocalypse's events that are contemporary to the author are often portrayed as if they were prophesied long ago, so that what is happening in the author's day is merely a fulfillment of what was revealed centuries before. Is that true of Revelation? Yes. Apocalypse has served to tell current events to those in the dispersion. As Josephus tells the barbarians, he says he wrote his books in Aramaic first to distribute out in the places that he called barbarous places, outside the empire. And then he wrote it in Greek for Romans. We lost the Aramaic version. It's the Greek version we have now. But we found the Aramaic version recently. And the Aramaic version is far more revealing in certain aspects of Israel than the Greek. In fact, there is a long and detailed description of John the Baptist in that Aramaic version of Josephus that tells us things about him that we never knew before, things that are quite prophetic. Almost gives us the idea in the Aramaic version that Josephus became a believer. A radical divine intervention occurs to overthrow God's enemies and set things aright. My partner in this ministry, Bogdan G. Shrumkoff, calls this the apocalyptic lie. All of a sudden, everything's going terrible. Everyone's getting killed, persecuted. Blood is flowing up to the horse's bridle. And then an intervention. The skies open. Heavenly bodies come down, make everything all right, turn the world into a paradise. All apocalypses have that. Okay, there's my other stuff. Now, I want to spend the last 10 minutes looking at a little of Revelation. And next time, if you want to continue with me, I want to go through the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24 and show you that the revelation of John is the fulfillment of the Olivet Discourse. But first we need to look a little bit at the Revelation. If you have it there, turn to Revelation 1. You that have been with me for a while, you've already heard this several times, I'm sure. We're just going to read through the first chapter. I want you to note a few things, and I'm going to have to go looking for it right now. There's a certain better translation that came out here recently. And if I can find it, if I can find it here on my computer, I want to share it with you. Someday I'm going to translate it myself. Oh, there's so many of them. Document files, where are you? Text files? No. Office files, try that. Uh, here it is. I think this is it. Uh, 
Oh, would you know, it's not going to open for me. That's a sad story. Oh, I see why. Okay. It's just in a... Um, here it is. This is pretty good. It's not sacred name. but it is translated a lot better. How can I get this to you? If you want it, let me say, uh, put something in the chat if you can. I have this online, but I don't know where. This is a very accurate translation though. And we have interlinear Lots of notes. Okay, chapter one. You want it in Greek or English? The revelation of Yahshua HaMashiach, which Elohim gave to him to show to his servants, doulois, right here. Strictly means slaves. Diakonoi is servants. Douloi is slave. To show his slaves what things must soon take place. Soon. Uh, if this was written, we'll say, just use the uh, 70 AD when these things in here happen, would soon be thousands of years later? Hundreds of years later? What does Joshua say about the temple stones? These will all be knocked down. One stone won't be left upon the other. He says, this generation will live to see it all. Well, he spoke these words in about 30 AD. A biblical generation is 40 years. That brings its happening to 70 AD. And this is when the writer here is writing. And which he communicated when he sent it via his malik to his servant, again, slave, John. I guess uh, slave is not really... Um, politically correct these days. Revelation, the word is apocalypsis. It means a revealing or an opening or a pulling back of a curtain. What he's trying to do here is pull back the curtain of history of what's going on in his place. And we'll, we'll see that in just a second. We're just going to go through this chapter and I'll let you know. So we have right here the sign of an apocalypse rather than a prophecy. There's an angel there who has confirmed as the word of Elohim and the testimony of Yahshua HaMashiach what all things he saw. I'd like to know what that footnote is right there. Because the writer's putting this in the past. Most gospel and revelatory stuff in the New Testament is written in what's called historical present tech, tense. Historical present. It's happening now. Yahshua eats with sinners. Yahshua walks to the temple. Not walked, but translators put it in past tense, which takes away so much excitement of it. But in this particular case, and sure enough, it is in past tense. How fortunate, Makarios, same as in the, uh, same as in the Beatitudes. Makarios, nobody knows what it means. Some translate it happy. Some translate it blessed. This is probably the best. How fortunate. Some translate it, congratulations too. 
Makarios. How fortunate the one reading and those listening to the words of this prophecy. Remember, the word apocalypticus was not coined until just 1822. Keeping the things written therein. Why? For the time is near. If this was uh, for our time, would the revelator or the angel or Elohim himself say, this is in a couple of years or thousands of years? And who he's writing to? The seven assemblies, ecclesios, in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. That sounds like the sacred name, doesn't it? Yahweh. And from the seven spirits before the throne. Where do we find those? Isaiah chapter 2, is it? Or is it 9? I always get those mixed up. And from Yahshua HaMashiach, the faithful witness, that word in Greek is martyr, this book is about martyrs. He's the firstborn from the dead. This book holds in the resurrection and the ruler over kings of the earth. Now, who during the years 66 to 73 attacked Jerusalem and Israel? All the kings of the earth. Who rules them? Yahshua HaMashiach. He's on Mount Zion with his hordes, with his host, ruling over the kings of the earth and seeing to the day of Yahweh there in Jerusalem. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins with his blood. That's something that's going out of style too. That is, Yahshua is the final sacrifice and made us into a kingdom of priests for his Elohim and his Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Haolam vaed amen. Behold, he's coming with clouds, and every eye shall see him, including of those who pierced him. Let me ask you a question. Who pierced him? Uh, there's nobody's really established whether it was Rome or the Jews, but whoever did, according to the Gospels, hated him and were so very threatened by him. Where are those people today, those that pierced him? Where are they? In hell someplace? Yes, that's right. I'll, I'll get on uh, that chat in just a minute. I'm almost done here. Those who pierced him were very much alive in 70 AD. In fact, in Josephus' Jewish war again, we read about some of them. Some that held up in Jerusalem during the siege. Because as the Romans came from the north in a pincher movement, they moved everybody south. Everybody headed for Jerusalem because they knew those walls would hold. But they did it. And those who pierced him were there. And some of those ended up with a horrible fate. And all the peoples of the land will beat their breasts over him. So let it be. Amen, I am Alpha and the Omega, says Yahweh Elohim, the one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Again, he's stressing his power as the commander of armies. 1-9. Now we're going to define Messiah. 
I, Okanan, your brother and fellow in the oppression and kingdom and endurance in Yahshua, was on the island called Patmos because of what it says in the first, second verse, the word of Elohim and the testimony of Yahshua. We will find later on that these two witnesses, the word and the testimony, are later personified in people. And we can tell you who those people were. He was on Patmos, we suppose, as being put there in the copper mines. That's all that was there as punishment for his part in uh, the, the Jesus conspiracy. He was a true apostle. This is where he identifies himself. Is it really John? Which John is it? There's four Johns that we deal with. Some scholars believe this is John the Baptist. Most of them believe that it's John the Elder that we read about in some of the later Christian literature. But he tells us why he's there. And he says, I was in the Spirit on. I went to a Catholic seminary a couple of years, and when they were explaining this passage there, they said, well, we can see that John was worshiping on Sunday, on the Lord's Day. I thought at that time, come on, right here it is in the Greek, look. Te kurakai, hemora, kurakai. Kurakai is the sacred name. And this is the day. This is the day of the Lord. I was in the spirit, this should be a small s, during the day of the Lord. And I heard behind me like a, a voice, like a trumpet, saying, what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven assemblies. And then names the seven assemblies. John the Elder was known to be the bishop or overseer of these seven assemblies that were in a place that was then called Anatolia or Asia Minor, but today they're in Eastern Turkey. And I noticed a curious thing on Bible maps. On Bible maps, if you look at those cities on the map and you draw a line between the dots of cities, you form an arrow. Oh, you use Patmos as one of the dots. And that arrow, get a ruler, follow where that arrow goes, it goes straight to Rome. It goes straight to Rome. Maybe coincidence. Write in a book. And I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. I lost it again. Sorry. There it is. And among the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. Excuse me. <clears throat> Son of Man. We cannot understand what that expression means unless we find out from the book of Enoch. That is the only book that explains it. And as we know, uh, Enoch is quoted in the New Testament by the brother of Yahshua and alluded to many, many times. A lot of the theology from the New Testament comes from Enoch. In Enoch, the Son of Man is a figure who stands as mediator between all spirits and humanity and between Elohim and the spirits. It reminds me of that verse in 2 Timothy, there's one Elohim and one mediator between Elohim and man, the man, Messiah Yahshua, who gave his life a ransom for all. He's the middleman. And at this state, he's able to resurrect the dead and bring them down to Mount Zion to oversee. But he's not going to be there by himself. Because where is 
John in the Spirit. It's going to pop down and quit here. We're getting into deep uh, prophetic symbolism here. Then he tells who he is, that he is Messiah himself, has the keys of death and Hades. Write these things down. And he explains a little bit, but where is John in the spirit? As we go on, there's only one place he can be. And that is, he's back in Jerusalem, along with Messiah, Yahshua. Both are in Jerusalem in 70 AD. Let's quit here. And let me look at the chat. Is anybody left? Oh, we only lost a couple. Not bad. Somebody said amen. You want, oh yes, we want that, uh, want that translation. End times Bible prophecy, what? Is that good, Marcel? You've been listening to, who does it? John Hagee or Kenneth Copeland? Which translation do I prefer? I use the Revised Standard Version. Um, but if I'm doing something like this, I, I want to look at the language behind it. I never take, I never take the Bible English for anything other than a mistranslation. I'm a translator, and it wouldn't hurt anybody to learn a few a hundred Greek words because scripture was written in Greek. You might as well admit it. Might as well give up on the idea of Paul being written in Aramaic. No way. Unless you could prove it, you're welcome to. Okay, translation. Yes, who is that? All right. I'm sorry. Do I think there are some double prophecies? No. No, I'll tell you why. Uh, you might know Adam Drissel. Adam and I went on debate uh, probably three, four years ago. You've heard this before. We debated that debate is still up there on JS Presents. And um, when we got done debating whether Revelation was now or sometime in the future, he took the futurist view. He just, he couldn't take it. He had the future all worked out. And afterward, I tried to talk to him more about it. He said to me, unless you've got every I dotted at every T crossed. I won't believe it. Next thing we know, a couple of years later, he writes a book, The Mystery is History, where he's tracked it all down, gone a lot farther than I have, and put it in a book. He's totally convinced now, and this guy's no dummy. He's way ahead of me. Not saying I'm a dummy either, or you. But no, I don't think so. But what I think, uh, because you can't cross every T and dot every I. Nobody has had a scenario like that. I've been looking to it a long time. And I see these Latter-day Prophets, they've got to change every couple of years. They've got to continue to put a new carrot in, in front of the goat, a, a new gimmick, a new something that'll get them money or whatever they're after, fame or keep their TV show going or uh, keep them in seat seats. 
to be right honest with you, Hebrew roots teachers are the ones I've known of are mainly ex-Baptists or ex-Pentecostals with a tallit and a big belly and Christian eschatology with Hebrew roots words. That's what it is to me. Some of them I think are just disgusting. I'm sorry. <laughs> they probably think I'm disgusting too, but look, if you can't get this, if you can't be straight with the people you're teaching, hey, I'm not going to lie to you. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to tell you something different. I'm a teacher by of this by profession. I have been for many, many years. I'm not going to lie, and I'm not going to ask for your money. No, I'm not going to ask. I'm just going to beg when I need it. Okay? Like, uh, let's see. I, I have the money to go to the hospital, but I want to go to a better hospital. Send me $250,000 so I can get a minor surgery. Of course, that's just fictional. I'm not talking about anybody particular there. But I appreciate you staying on. And what I'll do is I will put that, I will find a link for that, and I'll put it up in the think tank. And it's probably already up there on those files. But if it's not, I'll put it up there for you, okay? It's a very good translation. Thank you for coming. God be with you and bless you. Maybe we'll see you next week.